Fasting, um, to define it, is just when you go without food for a period of time to give your whole self more fully over to God. Note, go without food. A lot of people, um, and, and no shame here at all, but a lot of people confuse fasting with abstinence. And you hear people say things like, I'm fasting from Instagram right now, or I'm fasting from TV, or I'm fasting from wine. All of that is great. Abstinence has a long tradition in the way of Jesus. We're in Lent, which is a great example. But fasting is a whole body psychosomatic practice that is very hard for us Westerners to get our heads around precisely because it has little to do with our heads. It's, not a, it's a way of saying yes. It's a way of consent to Jesus' work in your soul and your spiritual formation, not through your intellect, but through your stomach. Like, we're used to, like, let me read a book on that or listen to a podcast on that or an attend event on that. We're not used to, let me just not eat for a while on that. Like, that's outside of our Cartesian kind of worldview. For over a millennium, for over a millennium and a half, really up until the Enlightenment, fasting was a core practice of apprenticeship to Jesus. When Jesus teaches on spiritual discipline, he only names three, and fasting is one of the three. Most Christians would fast twice a week on Wednesdays and on Fridays from, sun, from waking up until after sundown. Even Lent, believe it or not, was originally a 40-day fast like the Muslim feast of Ramadan, where Christians, or festival, not feast of Ramadan, where Christians would not eat until after sundown for 40 days every single year. But with the Enlightenment, it all started to taper out. John Wesley in the 1700s, I found this quote, it's money, said this, I fear there are now thousands of Methodists, so-called, both in England and in Ireland, who following the same bad example have entirely left off fasting, who are so far from fasting twice a week. So up to the 1700s, it was still thought of that if you're any kind of a serious Christian, you fast twice a week. That they do not fast twice in the month. You know who you are. He went on to say, and forgive his, his male language here, the man or the person who never fasts is no more in the way to heaven than the man who never prays. Now, I'm not saying he's right. I'm not here to like add legalism to your life. Um, I'm just saying we've come a long ways in a short period of time to where very few followers of Jesus even fast at all, much less on a regular basis, much less twice a week. And yet we believe this is one of the most important practices for our time. The Spirit of God is always zigging where culture is zagging. So it's always moving in the opposite direction of the gods of our age. So as the movement is towards sensuality and indulgence of the body, the movement of the Spirit is to a greater call, a more radical holiness, a deeper surrender, more fasting, not legalism, but more ache in the body for God. Can you imagine what would happen if our entire church began to fast on a regular weekly basis to give our whole body over to God, to consecrate our literal flesh over to God and say, your will be done in my body as it is. Can you imagine the effect that would have on our church? Even since we've started our new rule of life, all sorts of people across our church are now fasting on a weekly basis, short fast, just until dinner once a week. And just that is transforming my wife. It's transforming my oldest son. It's transforming my best friend. It's transforming multiple people in our leadership team. Just that. For those of you that are new to fasting, we do have a teaching series and practice all up if you want to know more because there's tons here to nuance and tons of what about there's all of that is at practicingtheway.org slash fasting if you want more. Let me just summarize it because you have to get the why behind fasting. We fast for three basic reasons. One, to starve the flesh and feed the spirit. The flesh is language used by the New Testament writers to name not just your body as a whole, but that primal animal part of our body that is run by survival instincts and the desire for pleasure, what scientists call our animal brain. Your flesh in biblical imagery from Genesis 3 on is like a beast within. If you feed it, it grows stronger, but if you starve it, it loses its hold over you. And one of the best ways to starve your flesh is to literally not give your body food. Spiritual masters of the way of Jesus have long noted that both the garden temptation of Adam and Eve and the desert temptation of Jesus had to do with food that is not arbitrary or random. There is a reciprocal relationship between our level of self-discipline with food and our level of self-discipline with sin. As Thomas Kempis said it in one of the most important books in 2,000 years. He said, Restrain from gluttony, and thou shalt the more easily restrain from all the inclinations of the flesh. 
In context, he was talking about fasting. The less limits we have on our appetite, the less limits we tend to have on other bodily appetites as well, such as for sex or shopping or gossip or even for violence. One of the first things you notice when you start fasting is that your desire for sin doesn't go away, but it does go down, and your desire for God goes way up. You start to crave prayer where before you were craving all sorts of other things. It's a way to turn your body from an enemy in the fight to an ally. Second, we fast to amplify our prayers. Fasting is a way of praying with your body. Theologian Scott McKnight calls it body talk, or Romans calls it groaning beyond words. It's a way of growing in the power of the Spirit. Much could be said about this, and forgive the lack of nuance, but as much as we hate to admit it, there is a reciprocal relationship between our level of holiness and our level of power in the Spirit. The holier we are, the more power we have access to in the Spirit. Fasting is one of many ways to grow in holiness and therefore to grow in power. This is my best take on why Jesus said, this kind comes out only by prayer and fasting, while his disciples could not drive it out, and he could. Finally, we fast to stand in solidarity with the poor. This is the fasting of Isaiah 43. It's a way to stand in solidarity at a practical level, to just take the money that you would have spent on food that day or for that period of time and give it to those with not enough food at all, and to stand in solidarity from the inside out, not as a savior from the outside, but as a brother or sister.